Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's securityboulevard.com webinar. We're excited that you've joined us. We have a great topic, a New Year's re ransomware resolution. We all need resolutions, but how about that ransomware? We have a really good uh, panel of speakers today I'm excited to introduce to you. Our webinar is being sponsored by Axio. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'll serve as your host and moderator. A few housekeeping items. We are recording the webinar, so sit back, relax. You can take it all in. Listen to our speakers today. We have a really great demo planned and set up. Uh, you can also go back and check out the recording later because we are recording it and we'll be sending the slides to everyone. So all participants will get an email with a link to the slides as well as uh, the recording. We also encourage questions from our audience. I know our speakers really love to entertain questions, hear your thoughts and engaging with our speakers. So be sure to use the questions tab in the GoToWebinar software. So let's move on to our topic, New Year's Ransomware Resolution. My pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. First is Dave White, who is president of Axio. And we have Garen Pace, who's cyber product leader with AIG. Let's get right to our topic. Gentlemen, I'll turn it over to you, Dave. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. And uh, thanks. thank you, Security Boulevard. And thank you for everyone who has uh, joined us today. Um, as we begin the new year, it's it's natural to to ask the question of what changes we need to make. And as cybersecurity professionals, we're always asking that question uh, in response to changes in the threat landscape. And uh, one of the major threat expansions that we've witnessed over the past couple of years has been ransomware. The the pace, scale, and prevalence of ransomware has continued to increase. So that's the topic today. As we begin this new year. Let's take a fresh look at ransomware and what we can do about it. So we're going to cover these topics today. Um, we'll start with a really high-level review of ransomware trends. We're going to briefly talk about the privileged visibility that cyber insurers have, and my good friend Garen Pace, who has joined us today, the kind of the kind of data that he has access to and will share with us. Ransomware has evolved. We're going to talk about the evolved ransomware attack pattern and how ransomware, uh, using that attack pattern, ransomware attackers are demanding higher and higher uh, ransoms. We'll wrap that up with talking about the top three things you should do right now, and that's backed by the data that Garen has access to, given his privileged visibility. Um, and we'll wrap up with a ransomware preparedness assessment that Axio is releasing today, we're making that available to all subscribers in our Axio 360 platform. We're also making it available as part, of our, as part of our free tool. I'll give a very brief demo of that toward the end and tell you how you can get signed up. So with that, let's move on to um, some introductions. I'm David White. I'm the co-founder and president at Axio. I've been working in the cybersecurity world for about 20 years now and um, have uh, architected and authored a number of of methods, models, and frameworks over the years. I've been working with Garen Pace for about five years now. Garen is incredibly knowledge about, knowledgeable of cybersecurity, and Garen likes to joke that AIG has invested millions in his cybersecurity education. So Garen, tell us a little about your background. Thanks, Dave. Um, yes, um, I, I've been working at AIG for 15 years now. I've been very fortunate. Um, I started as a line underwriter. Um, underwriting professional liability insurance and a little thing that at the time we called cyber insurance, this newfangled product. So I've been very fortunate to, to be in this space. Um, that joke goes to the, you know, the idea that, um, you know, obviously cyber insurance is a growing market. We've seen lots of, of claims paid out. Uh, every one of those is an opportunity to learn. And that's what Dave's going to talk about the, um, you know, what, what insurance can bring to the table and, and hopefully um, improve improve best practices and, and elevate everyone's game. So my job at AIG, um, I'm part of a global team that makes sure that AIG underwriters are underwriting cyber risk correctly wherever it exists in an AIG insurance contract, and we bring the right tools to the job, the right pricing, the right thinking. So um, pleased to be here uh, to join Axio to talk about ransomware and what we can do um, to, to stop it. Um, it. It definitely is a, uh, a a plague that needs addressing. So. Um, really pleased to talk to you all. Thanks, Garen, and thank you for you've you've put a lot of time into preparing for this with me, and I really appreciate your generosity and and sharing some of your data and insights with me and with the audience today. 
So let, let's start by taking just a very quick look at some ransomware statistics. Ransomware continues to rise as one of the top uh, cyber threats impacting companies worldwide. Uh, you see that first stat there, um, the year-over-year -year increase in ransomware attacks in the U.S. So we've seen more than a doubling of attacks from Q3 2019 to Q3 2020. Um, Garen, can you comment on this second uh, this second stat about about ransomware now, including data exfiltration? Sure. Um, so you know, while we've seen, as Dave mentioned, the evolution of ransomware uh, over the past couple of years, and we'll talk more about. Um, you know how it's being deployed in a little bit more, a little bit more strategic sense um, by the attackers. But one of the more recent trends that we've seen started in um, the beginning of 2020, really, uh, is not only um, the encryption of of files and the ransoming back of, of the availability of, of the network, um, but also exfiltrating data. So um, to increase the amount of leverage they have and, and to get the victims to uh, in their eyes, hopefully, you know, uh, pay their demands. Um, they are not only ransoming back the decryption key, um, but they are also exfiltrating the data and then threatening to publish it. They're extorting victims as well. Um, that's unfortunately a, a trend that has started in 2020 and, and seems to be seems to be accelerating. So you should be aware that, you know, not only is ransomware a big threat to availability, um, you know, uh, interruption, but all the risks that come attendant with with uh, data breaches also come into play. Uh, increasingly, um, you know, whether it's liability, uh, reputation damage, um, regulatory uh, risks, um, uh, unfortunately, really piling on. And then, so yeah, so these events are getting a lot more complex as you pull in all of those data breach impacts in addition to the ransomware recovery impacts. What, what's, talk about what's happening with ransom payments, and we're going to see some of your data in a little while, but we see this stat from uh, Coveware. So yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, and we can get. We'll talk more in a few slides about what it means, how we've seen this evolution of ransomware from something that was largely um, trying to lock up a single computer to something that is targeting an entire the entire network, um, really. Um, but we've seen attackers play a little bit more of a long game and. Um, find and disable backups um, and really try and find out where, where where the critical data is and we've seen them scale their their demands uh, along with that effort um, so we've certainly seen um, significant increases in ransoms um, some of them we'll talk in a little bit are, are unfortunately uh, millions if not tens of millions of dollars it's a it's a big it's a big deal it is uh, a plague on business, I think, is yeah, I've said it before, and we we really need to really need to be addressed. What's what's that old car ad? This is not your this is not your father's ransomware. Yes, this is uh, this is not this is not your father's ransomware. We were joking earlier, Dave and I. Um, you know, ransomware used to the demands used to be in the hundreds of dollars, and, and and the biggest loss was you know maybe some pictures or some documents on your personal computer. Um, you know, now these attacks, unfortunately, are, are, are crippling networks. They're stopping stopping production of, of um, whatever a company is producing, stopping the flow of information. Um, they are they are very significant uh, incidents. Great. So um, I'd like to just talk a, for a few minutes about the the privileged visibility and role that um, that cyber insurers have. Um, and why why insurance matters to cybersecurity leaders. So, you know, cyber insurers are some of the only organizations that have data on the cybersecurity posture of an organization before an event and detailed insights into what happened during an event and how the event occurred. So they're one of the few places in the world where we can really look for, um, for real data on the effectiveness of controls. And this wasn't cyber insurers, but in the last century, the insurance industry was was credited with solving the boiler safety problem by driving safety and engineering standards uh, to solve that risk. And that's a that's an example of what I like to call the promise of insurance, where by aggregating all of this data on the the um, before event posture of an organization 
and what happened during an event that caused the organization a loss, the industry has an enormous capability for driving change in the industry. When I uh, went in the cybersecurity world, when I, when I first met Garen about five years ago, he was busily working on what then was a, a problem that we were all reading about in the news and, and some of us fighting, which was the point of sale intrusions. And I think that you know, the insurance industry did make a difference with point of sale intrusions. Garen, can you tell us about that and then what insurance is doing today to proactively address ransomware? Sure. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, so uh, believe it or not, cyber insurance has been around for 20 years now. A few years ago was was probably one of, you know, its first big tests when we saw those large point of sale intrusions. Um, you know, I think I think it was kind of the height of of um, stealing credit cards and, and, and criminals reselling them for profit. Um, and, that, and as, you know, the cyber insurance market was growing year after year and year, and it was our first big test, this, this this threat had had kind of grown to its maturity. Um, you know, there was a there was a significant problem in the market. Um, you know, there was a significant problem in, in security. A lot of these big uh, point of sale intrusions and lots of credit cards being stolen. So um, I'm pleased to say that at the time, insurers responded how we we want uh, insurance in general to operate. Um, they looked at the problem and said, we see these losses. This is why they're uh, this is how they're unfolding. Um, these are the best practices that we, you know, we believe will um, uh, reduce the risk, and they provided incentives to implement them. And you saw folks who were in the cyber insurance market, um, you know, being educated about that. You know, say, hey, we we believe this is the best in class solution. Um, it didn't mean you had to get it to to, to get insurance, but you would pay less uh, if you adopted those uh, um, those practices that. Were proven, um, were proven to reduce risk. Uh, and, and at the time, um, it was with end-to-end -end encryption of credit cards uh, to prevent, even in the incidence of a, of a data breach or into the, into the company, um, you know, the loss of those credit cards. So in terms of ransomware, uh, we are very fortunate. Uh, I am very fortunate to be in this position where, unfortunately, we see bad things happening, but we want to educate and we want to push those controls which we think have the best return return on investment um, to again help educate our, our customers uh, and to and to reduce the risk of ransomware. And Garen, you, you've been you've been very generous in sharing some AIG data with us for today. So let let's take a look at the first of of two pages of data. Um, tell us what we see here on the left. Sure. Um, this, what I hope you see here on the left really just illustrates that you know ransomware is a is an increasing uh, as, as Dave mentioned an increasing threat um, for the past couple of years now um, it has seen no no um, no slowdown in its pace uh, I should mention that of course the cyber insurance market has been growing so the more policies you write uh, the more claims you're going to see um, I, I can tell you if you look at these graphs uh, these bars here on the left um, the cyber insurance market has not been growing that much. And you're, you're looking at um, that last stat there for the six months of 2020, um, the six months of 2020 already being three quarters of 2019. Um, that, that's, that's, some, that's some steady growth. Um, you know, I, I want to be, be cautious. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we, fortunately and unfortunately, but uh, AIG is a publicly traded company. I can't yet comment on, on Q4, um, but I think that these stats show um, that certainly at, through uh, Q3 of, of 2020, um, ransomware has only continued to, to grow in frequency. Um, in, our, in our data, I think that matches uh, the greater, um, you know, the, the greater uh, threat suite that companies see. Uh, you, of course, we all read about it in the news and it continues to, to impact not just the cyber insurance market, but business at large. And, and on the right, we see that it's also the, the claims seem to be increasing in um, scale as well. If I, am I interpreting that correctly? Yes, um, exactly. So what we're trying to show here is that, um, you know, over the past couple of years, um, you know, cyber insurance covers all manner of things. Um, we're not here to talk about that. Um, but what we are going to talk about is how ransomware ha has become, has increased its market share. On, on the biggest losses that we see. And I think that's a, a direct um, result 
of, of the frequency and severity of ransomware only increasing. There's a little, little bit of a caveat here, you know, insurers, we have to deal with development. So sometimes it takes time for claims to, um, to, to, for us to, to mature and for us to see the final cost of an incident. Um, it's the reason we, you know, don't have early 2020 data uh, to show you. Um, but I think that there is enough here for you to see that um, ransomware is becoming a bigger and bigger and probably now the lion's share of what is driving uh, the cyber insurance market in terms of severity. So, so not only are like, these claims frequent, but severe. So things like data breaches tend to develop more slowly so that the, it, takes, it takes much longer for you to see the total amount of the event. Right, for the, for the you know, for the, um, for any live, you know, um, any liability to come through in the form of, you know, banks taking, banks taking action, um, victims filing shareholder suits. Sometimes data breaches take a long time to unfold. Ransomware is, is, is uh, relatively um, very, very fast developing. Um, a lot of the costs of ransomware um, impact an organization immediately. And, and that also translates into cyber insurers being impacted very quickly. Got it. And so um, I know AIG is one of the world's largest cyber insurers. Can you just say a few words about the type of companies that you insure so that we understand where, where what this data represents from a market perspective? Sure. Um, AIG is a, is a global uh, insurer. Um, our cyber insurance book uh, is also global. Um, it skews a little bit towards North America. Um, cyber insurance had, you know, uh, was was marketed first and probably is most heavily penetrated uh, in North America. Um, but lately, there's been a lot of growth uh, in Europe. Um, we have a significant presence in Europe and in uh, Asia Pac and even in, in, in South America. Um, so it is truly a global look. Uh, in terms of size, you know, AIG writes. Um, small companies all the way up to Fortune 1000 companies. So I think it is a, a pretty good representation of, of the entire um, you know, profile of companies doing business. I will say, we, we, compared to some other insurers, we, we probably skew a little bit towards, towards the bigger side. Um, there, are, there are some insurers out there who write uh, more, more, you know, a higher number of, of smaller companies. Um, but I think it is a, it, it is a good. Um, probably one of the most uh, fair looking at, at the entire scope of business. Got it. So look, let's look at let's look at the data page two. What what does this data tell us? So on the left here, what we're really trying to you know, as, as the bullet point speaks to, um, is that ransomware affects everyone. Um, you know, again, you know, a couple years ago when when we saw those large, you know, point of sale intrusions. Uh, you know, there were a couple industries that were that that were really um, more heavily pressured by that threat. Um, and even in the recent past, um, you know, we saw a lot of you know data breaches in general were something that um, companies who had a lot of PHI or a lot of credit cards were were really more concerned about. Um, where you know we haven't seen that. I mean, we. As insurers, you know, we, we want to make sure that we price for the risk appropriately. And as we look across the, the, the spectrum of, of our insureds who have had claims, ransomware seems to be um, pretty equal opportunity. Uh, no sector or geography is, is immune, and, and that's what we're trying to show there on the left. And on, the, on the right, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, ahead. Dave, go ahead. No, no, I was going to ask you, what about the right? Uh, on the right, a uh, couple of... Um, Couple of things. We just wanted to show the, the 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 movement in ransom demand. So on the right there, you know, all four of these um, bar charts are supposed to show us how that shift there. So on the right, um, we've seen the ransom demand uh, over the past couple of years. Be, you know, back at the kind of the, the your father's ransomware. I guess we were we were joking around. We saw small ransoms, you know, almost under a thousand dollars. And lately, we've seen ransoms approaching you know uh, into the tens of millions of dollars. Um, and this, this is 2016 to 2020, uh, as the bullet point says, I mean, if we were to look at, you know, 2020, um, we're seeing average demand in, in the millions of dollars. Um, the second and third ones, uh, on the right here, uh, the, the average response, uh, cost, 
um, for, for, for breach counsel uh, and, and, and incident response, uh, apologies, incident response first, then breach counsel. Um, you know, to be fair, this is for all incidents. That said, um, the vast majority of what these firms are responding to are ransomware these days. Um, so I think it is reflective of ransomware and it just shows the, the typical cost. Um, and we talked earlier about how a lot of these ransomware incidents now include data exfiltration, um, which obviously puts a little bit more pressure on the on the on the breach council side to deal with all the regulatory regulatory component. And then the last one um, is 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 what our data sees um, the average the average amount of interruption over the past couple of years. And um, unfortunately, we you know it it again it correlates with these attackers are are being more strategic. Uh, they're not deploying ransomware immediately, um, you know, sending email, spray and pray. Um, these attackers are taking their time to, to uh, get a, you know, get into victims' environments, into their networks, find where the backups are, do reconnaissance, uh, and then truly um, disrupt a business's ability to, to run its business, um, whatever that is, causing significant disruption. Um, Garen, Garen, I've always thought about breach counsel, those outside attorneys that you bring in to help you deal with a data breach as as being um, sort of the folks the folks that that companies would engage if they have data exfiltration. And I know that data exfiltration is is increasingly a part of ransomware because of what you said earlier and and, and the data we've seen. Um, are are you suggesting that that anyone who suffers a ransomware event should should consider engaging outside counsel to help them through that event? Um, so I, I believe that I, uh, I believe that companies generally should. And, and let me tell you why. Um, our, our claims professionals are, are better su suited to give this guidance. Um, but more and more regulation has, is, is getting involved um, with, with understanding the full range of cyber incidents going beyond just data breaches and how they might impact us. Um, so there, you know, because there is a data exfiltration component, um, because of potential liability, um, I think there are a lot of reasons that that uh, if I were the owner of a business who suffered a ransomware event, I would definitely be be using breach counsel um, to uh, understand my obligations, uh, to make sure that um, some of the parts of of the incident that should be privileged, some of the advice that I'm given about the incident that should be privileged, remain um within the four walls of the organization i think those are all important things to do got it and the, the the another thing that really shocked me about this data was that that maximum business interruption length of 90 days i mean i think that you know a lot of companies i've talked to are really um optimistic that they could recover from an event like this in a few days seeing the average of 10 and the max of 90 makes me concerned that the data isn't isn't bearing that true yeah, so um, uh, there's a few interesting points on this, and I, I know we have a lot of content to get to, so I'm going to try and go through them pretty quickly. Um, one, I think a lot of companies in the face of ransomware were, were just saying our recovery strategy wasn't meant to deal with this. Um, you know, we, we, I was prepared to, if the western half of the United States fell off the map, I, was pre I had two data centers, and I was prepared to do an east-west or west-east recovery. And the first time they saw their entire network locked up by ransomware, this does, you know, uh, we, we didn't, we an architect to deal with this. Um, you know, I also think you need to reach containment before you can even start recovery. Uh, and and these, these attackers, you know, the term sophisticated attackers is, is a little bit overused. Um, but there, some of these attackers, these, these organized criminals deploying ransomware, um, you know, they are, they are very skilled. And, and, you know, achieving containment first before you can start recovery often takes time. Um, so that, that 90 days, um, I, I believe that that is reflective of, of not a solid interruption, but intermittent degradation uh, okay. in that specific example that, I'm aware, that we're aware of. Um, but nevertheless, you know, these incidents are, do have, you know, are having material impact on companies um, for more than, they've, more than they were prepared, more than they thought they allowed in their risk assessment. And we see that in the news, right? Um, so I... I, I I think if there's one takeaway that companies should really be taking a good look at their recovery strategy and how that how it lines up next to um, next to the realities of today's big game hunting ransomware. Got it. Great. Two two great recommendations out of the data we see. Let's let's move on to this um, 
the evolved attack pattern here. A lot of people are calling this big game hunting ransomware. Um, what, what can you tell us about that term? Where did that come from? This this is the ransomware that's bringing a lot of company companies to their knees. So what's what's in that term? Uh, sure. So I, I, I think I think CrowdStrike um, used this the first time I saw uh, CrowdStrike use the term. You might hear others call it interactive ransomware, human operated ransomware. What we're really talking about is is what we had uh, mentioned earlier. Is that you know uh, in contrast to what how ransomware was deployed three four years ago, um, attackers you know kind of put it as an attachment in an email and and sprayed it out as spam and you know they hoped that a few people were you know unfortunately clicked on it and and they got a few small ransoms. Um, attackers are now going after big game. They're, they're going after the entire network. And where they are getting someone to, to click on a link, where they are using phishing as an entry point into the organization, their first thought is not to deploy ransomware. It is to play a little bit more of a long game, um, escalate privileges, move laterally, do some reconnaissance, find the data, um, and, 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 and then go after uh, deploying ransomware, not to a single computer, but to, to you know, as much of the network as they can, um, you know, where, where you know, as many of the production servers as they can. So I think that's the origin of, of, of the term big game hunting. And I think it adequately describes the type of, um, the type of strategy that these, these actors are deploying when they deploy ransomware. So um, th th we list four initial compromise points here. And these are um, consistent with what we've seen from a, a number of sources. Coveware has has data that they report on these four uh, initial compromise points. It, can you comment on on whether this aligns with what you've seen in your data? Sure. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's pretty close. Um, perhaps because we skew a little bit more towards the, the bigger side, uh, which I mentioned earlier, um, we actually see a little less. RDP compromise in our data in, in, in more phishing as the initial entry point, um, but but I I think um, I think that's just because of our different view, a little bit of a different profile. Uh, Coveware certainly um, has a lot of data. Um, they are they are doing a lot of work in this space, um, and I think that any company who is who is thinking about ransomware uh, and, and their resilience, as I all I hope our audience is, um, should be looking at all four you know all three of these entry methods and we can talk about what other includes um, seriously uh, because you know there are multiple multiple avenues that attackers are using and uh, I think to truly be safe we need to you know we'll never stop all of these um, but we want to certainly reduce uh, the, the amount that's coming into the top of the funnel uh, and that the team has to has to kill later in the in the in the kill chain got it and so just a quick question on the network edge vulnerability. Are these, are, are you seeing um, misconfiguration errors in, in network facing equipment or are these soft uh, patchable uh, software defects that are patchable that are going unpatched for some period of time? Sure, um, what we've seen is, is attackers exploiting um, true vulnerabilities, you know, uh, software defects that have been reported to the manufacturers um, a patch has been available, and unfortunately, companies either, you know, didn't prioritize patching, uh, you know, in hindsight as much as they should have, or you know, where they where they were patching, unfortunately, their, you know, their coverage w wasn't what it what it should have been. Um, I don't mean to trivialize patching; it is it is a tough it is a tough thing, um, especially when you're talking about large numbers of devices, uh, all the complications that exist, um, you know, uh, but. Uh, we definitely saw one of the bigger trends that we saw uh, was attackers going after some of those those known vulnerabilities in network appliances that were announced in, in the past. You know, a lot of 2019, 2020 had a lot of these uh, you know, VPNs, load balancers, et cetera, uh, a lot of vulnerabilities in those remote access solutions. And the attackers took the time to, to scan the internet, find those victims, uh, and then exploit them. It's really a great avenue for ransomware attackers because it not only a toehold into the comp into the victim's network, um, you know, an avenue in, uh, but a lot of times uh, they'll they'll find a lot of credentials uh, in those network appliances, particularly if you're talking about you know a VPN. Um, got it, got it. So once they get in, what what are they doing? 
so what, so what we see is um, again uh, uh, attackers are taking a little bit more of a um, a long term view and and I'm going to use that let me qualify that um, oftentimes these attacks can unfold very quickly I mean uh, usually a matter of days maybe a little longer weeks but we've seen them as short as a few hours um, uh, I'm talking when I say they take a little bit more time. I'm saying in contrast to a few years ago uh, when an attacker may have just um, sent out thousands of phishing emails with a ransomware payload. Here, the attacker is trying to get in and remain stealthy. The first time they get someone to click on a link, um, they're trying to um, escalate privilege, move laterally in the environment, um, take their time to find out where everything is. And their ultimate, their ultimate goal really is to, 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 to get domain admin privileges. Um, in the vast majority, I'm going to say the vast majority um, of times, I, I'm aware of one exception in my personal, you know, my specific knowledge, um, but they're after this domain administrator. They want to take those, compromise those credentials, which allow them to deploy their ransomware literally across the domain uh, and impact, um, you know, all, all of the computers in the domain. Uh, yeah, so you can't say all the time they're doing this because you do, you have seen one exception. Yeah, I've seen one exception among dozens, um, okay. but uh, it was a little bit of an oddity. So I, I do, I do okay. you know, we'll, we'll get into uh, in a bit, you know, what we think companies should be doing about this, but certainly protecting those privileged credentials is is high on that list. And then we see what what they do once they've once they've secured domain admin credentials. We see this sort of uh, triple threat of actions. H how often do we see all three of these things? Um, lately, it, it, it's becoming um, more common than not. Um, okay. uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the um, ransomware groups that are out there have, have moved towards exfiltrating data and setting up these so-called data leak sites. Um, so, so you know, we had always seen them, obviously, uh, uh, deploying their ransomware. Um, destroy backups, just to be clear, um, a lot of ransomware itself will destroy shadow copies. Um, that, that process happens, the, the ransomware does it as the ransomware is running, it's a little bit automatic. But we've also seen the, the attackers kind of hands on keyboard, say there are, you know, um, they, they, they've, they've endeavored to make sure that when they deploy the ransomware, they get the backup servers too. And if for some reason the backup server, you know, is maybe a, a Linux system, not a Windows system, um, they will actually go in and, physic and, and delete backups uh, to make sure that the, the, the ransomware, you know, puts the company in a position where they have to pay to get their data back. Um, and then of course they are actual trading data uh, uh, in, in the major, you know, we said earlier 50% of the time uh, recently. Got it, got it. And and so obviously this allows the, as we saw earlier, it allows a dramatic increase in ransomware payment and targeting allows the ransomware attackers to go after those companies that might be willing to pay those huge ransoms. And um, so you, you shared your top three recommendations with with me and let's share them with the, the listeners here today. Um, talk, talk me through these. Sure thing, uh, and I apologize, Dave. I'm, oh, there we go, the slide just turned over for me. Um, so the first one is, is protecting privileged credentials. Um, you know, as, a, as we said, uh, in, in almost every case, attackers are, are getting domain admin and then using that to, um, to push their, their ransomware to, to, you know, all the Windows computers in the domain, um, really targeting, you know, production servers, but also going after workstation. Um, from our point of view, if you can protect those privileged credentials, um, then then we can hopefully you know kill the chain at, at um, this this you know there's there's no way around it. I mean they they want that credential so they can deploy their ransomware widely. Uh, so we want to break that chain, and we think that you know um, multi-factor authentication is a is a strong control there. Um, if done right, it it, it really can um, break that domain. We, we mentioned down here, you know, scrutinize domain admin privileges and, and, and really look at service accounts. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, I don't think you can put MFA on service accounts. And we've seen um, a, a lot of companies who may have locked down, um, you know, the credentials used by their domain administra administrators, um, but then they had service accounts 
which are probably overprivileged. They, they, they didn't, you know, they weren't uh, compliant with the least privileged principle. And that was another route that attackers were able to use to, to get domain admin and to deploy that ransomware. The second and third um, wanted to hit on, you know, endpoint protections. You know, um, a lot of these attackers are, are not, they're not necessarily, they're not bringing, you know, zero days or, or what have you. Um, they are using some, some kind of, they're using some tried and true tactics. But they are smart enough to, to, or sophisticated enough, I think is a better word. They are sophisticated enough to make sure that whatever they are bringing, it might be a known technique, um, but they're going to put enough of a spin on it that it doesn't appear in, you know, any 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 list of signatures, any reputational source. Um, so, you know, companies need endpoint security protections that are able to detect a bad behavior without relying on any type of reputation source that says, oh, we've seen this attack, you know, we've seen this attack before, um, we've seen this file before, we've seen this technique before. Um, you know, these attackers are pulling down ransoms in the in the millions of dollars. They're they're bringing tools that that don't appear on a reputation source. So, um, you know, the the most recent endpoint um, security platforms seem to be able to to deal with this. Uh, they are used to clean up these incidents. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of companies are still relying on, it seems like, on legacy endpoint um, platforms and aren't getting the job done. And then finally, you know, uh, improving vulnerability management. A um, little bit, you know, it's not sexy, but uh, it, it's been said for a while. But when attackers continue to be able to, um, you know, take a, a, critical ex a critical vulnerability, which has been patched, and a patch has been available for, for several months, uh, an exploit, an externally accessible uh, device in a victim's network, and on top of that, that 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 device has privileged credentials inside it. Um, you know, we need to we need to it, it's making it too easy. Um, so while I know that patching isn't trivial, uh, we want to you know it is something that we should continue to um, to call out and to make sure, uh, particularly in those critical systems uh, which have have you know remote access and have credentials in them. Thank you. Uh, it, Gary, it seems like this, you know, the, the service account issue, just um, briefly, that that's going to be a hard one for organizations to do, right? I mean, if you've got a lot of, of endpoint solutions out there that are that are deployed using service accounts, that might that might take some time for for organizations to address. Is that what you're hearing from from your clients? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, it is true. So um, I'm just going to round this out a little bit. Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of services that, that an organization might use, whether it's you know a backup solution, uh, some type of asset management solution. Um, you know, it might have a you know a vulnerability scanner. It might you know they might um, have a service um, a service account component, which which they use to to log into other computers on the network and, and perform the service. Um, it, it is it is more work to go through and, and in accordance with the privilege of least principle say what specific rights does this service need for it to work? It is more work. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, while while just giving it domain admin may uh, may make it easy to work. Um, unfortunately, if an attacker takes over that account, that that that, that, in, that increases the risk. Um, so, I think that. You know, I'm not trying to call out companies and we're all in this security journey together, um, but I would hope that uh, companies recognize, while it might, you know, when vendors give their implementation guidance to companies, I would hope they realize that it may take a little bit more work uh, to give a service account only the entitlements it needs, um, but I think it is necessary to, um, you know, for security reasons to do so. Uh, and, in, you know, and, and to, it's one of the things that attackers are using to, to deploy ransomware, um, so it needs to be addressed. Got it, got it, great. So we're actually I was very pleased today to announce our ransomware preparedness assessment. Some of our our experts at Axio have worked on this over the past uh, over the past month or so, um, and have combined a lot of data sources, including a lot of a number of interviews. I would say maybe a lot of discussions with with Garen Pace to leverage what he's seen in the claims. We've organized the assessment into three goals, prevent, contain, and restore. 
those goals are supported by eight control objectives, four of them under prevent and two each under contain and restore. And then there's a total of 75 controls that align to those control objectives. Now, many of these controls are things that you um, will be familiar with. The ransomware is not the only reason to do them, but they are particularly important for ransomware. The ransomware preparedness assessment is available in our Axio 360 platform and our free tool. So for those of you who are interested in accessing the, first of all, the free tool, just go to our website, axio.com, and you can sign up for the free tool right there on our homepage. For existing users of our platform, oh, you have, um, uh, oh, looks like I've locked myself out. Give me a second while I get logged in here. Um, so for existing users, just log in, log in as you normally would. And uh, when you first log into the platform, as many of you are familiar, you will uh, first go to your assessment home screen. Now, some of the features here you may not see on the free tool and, and may vary based on, based on your license, but for anyone with access to the assessment module, you'll see a new ransomware assessment here at the bottom of the screen. You can launch that assessment. I'll just call this uh, a demo uh, as the name, and then that takes you directly into the assessment interface. You'll see a navigation bar here at the left where you can navigate at the sort of outline level. You see there prevent, contain, restore. And then you can also navigate here across the top by, by goal. Um, to answer these questions, we have a four point answer scale. Fully implemented means that, that's like your 95 to 100% answer. Largely implemented is like your 80 to 90% answer partially is less than 50. I usually think of that as the 20% answer. And then not implemented means we're not doing it. To answer the control, to rate yourself, you simply click on the answer. You can hold down the shift key and click to select a target. We, we highly recommend that you select a target. That'll help in planning your improvements based on this assessment. And then of course you can capture action items, notes and evidence here on the right-hand tabs. If we go back to the dashboard, a dashboard for a completed ransomware assessment, uh, I haven't created a milestone for this one yet, but you see the top level score out of a thousand points with a milestone here, your current score and your target score. So you can see from this sample that I'm currently at a 671 and I've set a target for 869. Uh, we recommend setting a target based on a specific time period, like what do you want to get done in the next 12 months or 24 months? You can see the, the summary here on a percent scale uh, according to those control objectives. And then this widget score comparison shows score comparison now, that's your current score in blue and your target score in green. As soon as we have enough data, we will publish benchmarks here for both current and target. So, so keep checking back if you complete one of these assessments for the benchmark data. Now I know that was a that was a fast-paced um, demo, but let's go back to the presentation. Uh, just in summary, you can sign up for the free tool if you're not a subscriber at axio.com. If you are a subscriber and you have access to the assessment module, you'll see the ransomware preparedness assessment there. We're making this available to everyone as part of our efforts to help companies prepare for and better uh, better protect themselves from this ransomware issue that we see affecting so many companies today. And if you have any difficulty signing up, accessing, or using the assessment, please reach out to us at support at axio.com. Dave, I, one, and I, I did want to mention that, um, you know, we, we you know, we've, we've worked together a lot um, to, to worry about this problem of ransomware and that um, we may have a slightly different thinking on it. Um, I, I think we're actually we're very close together, um, but AIG will accept um, the Axio ransomware assessment. Um, you know, that's one of the things that we are, you know, uh, looking for, looking for, have recently changed our underwriting standards on, um, but, but we've worked with Axio to make sure all the data is there. So um, that is another, another reason that if you are an Axio customer, um, that can also aid you in, in, in getting a, a cyber insurance uh, quote. So uh, 
uh, happy Great. to say, you know, happy to, to team up to hopefully uh, educate um, everyone, um, customers and applicants alike, uh, and to and to make make things a little bit easier uh, to get, get an insurance quote. That's thank you, Garen. That's that that's great news, and um, uh, thanks for thanks for sharing with us. That's that's fantastic. Um, so let's let's move into uh, let's move into Q and A. Mitch, would you come back and let us know what kind of questions we have? Yeah, happy to. We've got some great questions lined up here. So let's jump right in. Uh, first one is, what's your outlook? Does this continue to get to worsen before it gets better? Will it ever get better? I think this is the uh, the question of the ages, right? When it comes to ransomware, who'd like yeah, to Karen, take? What, what do you? I, I'd love your perspective on that, Karen. Why don't you take that? Yeah, um, you know, I, I I I I think I'm an optimist by nature, um, but 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 unfortunately, I think um, what I see suggest that it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Um, the trend, you know, the trend and the frequency that we've seen and the severity has only gone up. Um, you know, in fact, um, I, I, I don't have hard numbers on this. Um, so this is, this is an empirical observation. Um, but since that data exfiltration component came into play, we've, we've also seen, you know, uh, it seems like more people uh, unfortunately, having to pay the pay the extortion demand, which is, you know, only validates the the criminal's um, business model. Uh, I think that ransomware, you know, cyber in general, including ransomware, is a manageable risk. I want to be clear. Um, it is, you know, let's, let's not be defeatist. Um, so I think that um, there are, you know, you know, using the controls that we mentioned um, uh, in smart risk assessment, uh, I think that we we can turn this tide. Uh, we will. Uh, however, I think that in the short term, um, it will probably get worse before it gets better. Dave? Uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that, you know, clearly the attackers are making a lot of money on it. Um, if you read the, the, the threat profiles and threat research, you see that it's, it's really easy to stand up um, a uh, ransomware business, if you will, using using ransomware as a service, tools, and things like that. So I think that it's going to continue to get worse before before it sees before it gets better. But you know, I also believe in the promise of of the data that you and other insurers have to help drive the change that will help stem this tide. So I'm I'm I do think it will get better. Great. Let's go to our next question. What types of claims are in the all other buckets. Yeah, so I, I um, and I apologize. Um, I think as we were talking about the initial entry methods that 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 uh, I think the Cobra data suggested um, that are used by attackers to to get initial access uh, and then you know subsequently deploy ransomware. You know we talked about um, brute, you know RDP um, whether that's brute forcing it um, or I think believe just brute forcing RDP. We talked about phishing. And we talked about external software vulnerabilities, and there's an, there's an all other category. Um, I, I off the top of my head, I don't know what the cohort data was specifically suggesting, but from our point of view, the things that I would say would probably round this out um, are call it a supply chain attack, if you will, third party. You know, unfortunately, some of these attackers are actually going after MSPs um, or, or, or other people who have access to a lot of other victims' environments. So, maybe possibly through no fault of your own. Uh, the, the the attacker can can attack the supply chain and, and come at your your uh, network. Uh, the other one that I would say falls into that bucket um, would be the use of of you know kind of I'm going to call them commodity botnets. Um, but a, but a a lot of ransomware attackers um, are buying access through access brokers um, into victims' networks. So where you may have seen um, you know malware in the past, which operated more as kind of a you know, a remote access, you know, kind of a password stealer, um, you know, the, the, the emotets and trick bots of the world, um, attackers are using those to, to gain entry into environment. So I, I would think that that um, falls in that all other bucket in the, in the cohort data. Very good, very good. Hey. Next question is, uh, what do you think the next evolution in ransomware will be? And where's it headed? Um, so uh, I think in the short term, um, I think unfortunately, 
the success that ransomware actors have had with exfiltrating data um, may lead them to to move, you know, even more towards this attack of of exfiltrating data and then extorting companies. Um, the encryption, you know, they may or may not still factor into their into their into their plan, uh, but it. In my, you know, from my observation, it seems like they've gotten a lot of mileage out of that tactic, and and you know the things that work, uh, they increase. So I am worried about um, attacks that that only try and exfiltrate more data and put companies in in in, in um, tougher positions. Um, so that's that's my immediate that's my immediate data exfiltration only continuing to build. Dave, do you have a a different outlook? No, I, I, I agree with you. I think the, the data exfiltration is making these much more complex events. And, uh, you know, as you and I have discussed many times, those um, once the data is gone, you have to treat it as though it's going to be disclosed from your data breach disclosure laws that may apply to you in your state or your country. And so um, I, I, yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's a trend that we're going to see continue to rise. Good, good. We've got a really interesting question here about backups. Uh, I'm curious why backups are not among the top three, not mentioned uh, much at all. I know you did reference it in your presentation, but if you have don't, don't, if you have good backups, can you ignore ransomware? What, what, say some more about that, Dave. Do you want to take that? Well, I think I think one of the problems here that we're seeing in the big game hunting pattern is that um, the attackers are able to get we see in the in the large predominance of the cases that 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 Garen has has reviewed here that the attackers are able to get the domain admin credentials and with those credentials it's with a little work it's easy if you've got network connected backups and the access to those backups is controlled by active directory then the attackers have a way to interfere with those backups and so we don't we haven't we haven't seen any hard stats on the number of cases where backups are actually destroyed as part of the attack. But I think that that's why um, we focused on protecting the Active Directory and domain admin credentials over backups because many, many organizations have network connected backups that are that are credentialed through Active Directory. Darren, is that? No, I think that's totally fair. Yeah, unfortunately, domain joined backups often are, are, are themselves the victim of the, you know, one of the assets that is locked up in the ransomware attack. So, um, you know, you need to make sure you have viable backups to, to recover from. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is that, you know, it, it certainly helps um, if, if your organization, you know, uh, is the victim of ransomware. I applaud you if, if you're if you are able to back up um, and, and, and not not have to pay the attackers for, for a decryption key. Um, you know, it, we need to raise the cost uh, to the attackers. Um, that said, uh, you know, we think it is possible um, not to give up all that ground, right? You know, saying I'm, 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 I'm just going to recover. Um, well, you still lost whatever your recovery, you know, however long it takes you to recover. Um, there's still half of the time a data exfiltration component. So you're not, backups don't save you from, you know, potential legal liability from disclosing sensitive data, uh, regulatory risk. Um, so again, we think, you know, um, this is a manageable risk, and we were we were really pushing on the, the the control areas we think that will help stop ransomware. You know, um, sometime in that in that kill chain between when they initially get access to the the environment, um, but before they comp, you know get domain admin uh, and the ability to, to to deploy ransomware across the environment. Uh, hopefully, we detect and 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 contain that. Um, we're never going to get the click rate to zero. You're never going to stop um, all phishing. Uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't try, um, but but that's why we, that, that was our ration, that was at least my rationale uh, in that advice. And look, Mitch, we we also um, we we could have talked for hours to and and talked through all 65 of the controls that we selected in the ransomware preparedness assessment. We picked uh, we picked Garen and I the top the top three based on his data that he thinks will make the biggest difference and, and decided to focus on those as a way to prioritize those for everyone's everyone's attention. But there are 65 controls in the assessment. 
Excellent. Sounds very in-depth. I'm excited to take a look at it. Um, I think next one question is a good one for you, Garen. Um, any recommendations around breach councils, incident response companies, use of those? What are your thoughts? Um, sure. You know, uh, listen, it, it's, a, it's a tough question for me to, to, to answer specifically, right? Um, I think that the circumstances um, of the incident uh, will dictate, you know, whether a specific uh, IR firm or a specific breach council um, is, is, you know, which one is the best recommendation for your company. Um, I, I would, I would definitely say that, um, you know, things that things that you might consider um, would be, you know, familiarity with your uh, your environment. I mean, certainly if a, if you have a relationship um, with a, an IR firm. Um, saves you a lot of the scoping if they know exactly how many endpoints you have, what tools they're going to need, um, where to start looking, right? Um, same thing with breach counsel on, on the legal side. Um, I also think, you know, depending on what the, there, there, there's a spectrum of attackers out there deploying ransomware. Um, depending on which one you get, you know, it might pay to, to, to work with someone who, um, you know, tracks that threat, uh, knows how they operate. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of nuance um, that, I don't have to, to answer that question with specificity, um, but I think that at the time, you know, unfortunately, uh, here's hoping you're not a victim of one of these incidents, but if you are, um, those are some of the questions I'd be asking, uh, including of those vendors, to make sure that you make a selection that is best for your company. Good, good. Uh, let's let's wrap up with this last question. There's so many good ones. And by the way, any questions that we didn't get to, uh, the folks here will reach out to you and. Uh, uh, definitely to help you get your questions answered as well as folks that are uh, trying out the free uh, ransomware assessment that we've re referenced. So last question we want to hit on is uh, what is a reason to ever pay the data extortion ransom? There's no way to guarantee that the attackers have deleted the data. It's not going to be still be used. So Garen, I'm just curious, how, how are you seeing, what, first of all, are you seeing people, are you seeing companies pay the ransom for the exfiltrated data? Um, Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with the question. I don't think there's a good reason to because there's no guarantee that it's going to be deleted. But, and have you seen cases where the attackers have come back for a second ransom demand after you've paid the first ransom demand for, for exfiltrated data? So I am not specifically aware um, of an incident where you know uh, the, the 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 same attackers had come back um, and, and kind of broken your broken their word, if you will. Um, again, we're talking about the word of a criminal. Um, there is some interesting. Uh, I want to give credit where credit's due. You know, Coveware, who's who's big in this space, uh, recently put out a report that said that you know in some instances. Uh, they had observed that these attackers who had been, you know, who had been paid, um, had violated their agreement and, and actually um, made some of the sensitive data public in violation of their agreement. Um, I agree with the sentiment, you know, it, it, it you, you can't put the data back, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, you can't, you can't, how, how are you going to know the data is quote unquote returned? Um, that said, um, there are certain amounts, you know, maybe what the attacker is, is asking for uh maybe the amount might be worth um i'm try just trying to give the companies these companies the benefit of the doubt that it, it might be worth it just from a pr perspective um so that you can get a jump on managing uh the data get a firm in place to look at what's being shared on, on the dark web or um you know make sure you get your notification out on time and, and and talk with your customers give them time um but yeah it is it is hard to justify uh but unfortunately um sometimes happens. Oh, with that, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this up. Folks need to get to their next Zoom call. Right? <laughs> so uh, we thank you, gentlemen, both of you. Excellent conversation, discussion, and uh, demo presentation today. Excited, excited about the assessment. So we'd like to thank everyone for joining us. We do want to announce our four gift card winners. Those winners are Eric B., Garrett M., Sarah T., and Shelly Y. 
folks here at securityboulevard.com will be reaching out to you to get a hold of those uh, gift cards, maybe pay off some of those Christmas uh, bills that we all have. <laughs> so again, thanks for sharing with us today being and spending your time. Uh, thank you to David White, the president of Axio, and Garen Pace, who is cyber product leader at AIG. You know, your time's extremely valuable, and uh, frankly, we're honored that you would spend it with us, and we hope we used it well. Have a good rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.